In America, the self-proclaimed greatest country on earth, people work five days a week for 40 hours a week so they can get to the weekend and recklessly drink to forget that week and nurse a hangover with the Lord every Sunday. That's the American way. Excess and repression, that's what the red and white stripes on the flag represent. Red for excess and pure for the white, repressing all the sins and pretending like they're not there. And before we continue, we should address that America did give itself the nickname of being the greatest. No other country came up with that nickname. And no one cool has ever come up with their own nickname. I mean, how much of an ego would Clark Kent need to have in order to say that he is the most super of all men? Hence, why he calls himself the Superman. Now, if, let's say, the, the Danes or the Swedes or the Africans said that America was the greatest, then we could consider it. Till then, America is just a kid that's trying a little too hard, hard to prove to everyone that He's not really a cop and that he, they can hang with the homeboys. American works, uh, on average, about 40 hours a week, or that's how it's supposed to be. As the hit 80s song suggests, we are all working for the weekend. But we shouldn't just be working for the weekend. I mean, we should be working for a lot more. We should be working for a better future and fulfillment and joy. And besides, at this point in our history, weekends are virtually non-existent in the so-called greatest country on Earth. American workers are exhausted. In 2019, most workers were on the clock for an average of 44 hours a week, have two to three jobs, and a lot of us have taken on jobs in the gig economy to supplement an income. And politicians will boast that this is a good thing because unemployment is down and that means the country is doing great. In reality, it means that the rich are getting richer on the exhausted backs of the working class. But in other countries, they're veering away from this model of labor. In Japan, Microsoft experimented with a four day work week. They found that it made workers more productive, everyone was happier, and there was less waste produced. The same results were found in New Zealand and Denmark. So why haven't we adopted this idea in the greatest country in the world? Now, a lot has to change in the mindset that surrounds labor and poverty in America in order to push forward with the idea of a four-day work week. Poverty in America is seen as poor people's fault. The narrative surrounding poverty is that if you're poor, then it's probably because you're lazy, unintelligent, irresponsible, and immoral. There's a, a moral juxtaposition in this, right? Or, or, or major juxtaposition in this, probably also a moral one. As we just mentioned, Americans are overworked with multiple jobs and yet remain to be stuck in a cycle of poverty. If hardworking people are in a lower income bracket, then how can they be lazy? How can they be irresponsible? And how is a variety of jobs determine your morality? I mean, this just shows us more proof that poverty is a systemic and institutional problem. Conservatives refer to poverty as a state of mind, but I'm pretty sure that it's the state of your bank account. The way that poverty is sold to the masses is that it's an individual's fault and they stress out a system that's there as a safety measure. So you see a lot of cuts in the social safety nets to supposedly help people. Ben Carson just cut $6 million worth of low-income housing, and the Trump administration is cracking down on SSI and disabilities. The idea behind this is that by cutting these services, it encourages people to go and find jobs and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. This is basically the same idea that your parents pitch you whenever they catch you smoking cigarettes, and then they make you smoke the entire pack. That makes no sense. You're worried about your kids' health, so you're making them do the thing that will jeopardize their health more? That's the, the only thing that we've accomplished here is that we've increased their nicotine tolerance. You're not punishing them, you're just giving them an accelerated death sentence. You know, in rehab for drugs, they don't pump your body with more drugs. In order to save a drowning person, you don't add more water into their lungs. So, so why would you think... 
to discourage someone from smoking, they should do it more. Or help people in a tough spot financially, we should make things financially harder for them. The issue with the pull your boot, pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality is that some of us don't have boots. Some of us do, but they're worn out and have holes in them, and pulling on them will just cause them to break more. Some of us have never even seen boots, and some of us are wearing Crocs. The ones that preach this philosophy are the ones that have more boots than anyone ever needs, and also exactly one pair of Crocs. The individualism preached in America makes us less responsible for each other. The real state of mind behind poverty is being distracted by the rich and powerful, saying there isn't enough for everyone, but at the same time, everyone can become rich and powerful. And there is some truth in that statement, but we become powerful when we're together, not broken apart fighting each other. If your success means that someone else has to fail, then there is something wrong with the system that you're part of. So, if America is going to reduce its work week down to four days, that means that the worker would have to be paid better. It would mean that the rules for the jobs would be the same as voting. One well-paying job for every person. Just like it should be one vote for every person. It means that if the price of goods and services inflate over the years, so does the pay for the workers. It's simple math, and if you're the greatest country on earth, then you should be able to understand that. So what happens to candidates that speak for the poor and working class people in America? Well, they get smeared and lied about on a pretty regular basis by the propaganda media of the oligarchy. There are only two candidates in the Democratic primaries that are on the side of the working class and the poor in America, Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard has been criticizing the Democratic establishment for abandoning the working class and becoming a corporate warmongering party and goes after all the wasteful spending of the military industrial complex, which uses the working middle class and poor people as cannon fodder for British people's wars. It's like the Boston Tea Party, except instead of throwing tea in a harbor, we throw poor people into the line of fire. Regardless, both have catastrophic events, uh, effects on people and nature. Listen, over-caffeinated fish are no joke. But for standing up with the American people, Tulsi has been smeared as a Russian asset, a Republican plant, and so on. They pitch her as some Manchurian candidate that's getting ready to assassinate democracy with logical policies and staying fit. The same thing has happened to Bernie countless times. This time, the warrantless attacks are coming from Elizabeth Warren's camp, which makes these attacks warranted. Okay, thank you. Good night. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to shut the podcast down now. Anyway, Bernie has been smeared by Elizabeth Warren staffers as they reported that in a private meeting in early 2019, Bernie claimed that a woman cannot be president. And I'm going to quote Bernie here because that's a ludicrous statement and Senator Sanders never said it. Bernie shot back at the slander and pointed out that this is a blatant lie. And what he said was Trump was a sexist and racist. He also pointed out that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by three million votes. It is important to note that the choice in 2016 was betwixt a rash on your taint or inside your eye. Just because 3 million people decided it would be better to have a rash on the inside of your eye doesn't mean that it was the right choice. What we need are better choices. Bernie is a choice to have no rashes on any part of our body. He's the calamine lotion of candidates. This is a blatant lie from the Warren camp. It was reported by the CNN correspondent that specifically sent over to cover Warren and she couldn't get a quote from Warren herself about the incident. And all this seems like it's in retaliation for Bernie canvassers pointing out the fact that Warren su Warren support comes from the upper class rich liberals and not the working class. And that's just a matter of public demographic data, not slander. The fact is that Bernie Sanders had the longest 
consistent record for standing with the American working class in the history of American politics, probably. In the 80s, Bernie was encouraging women to run for office, and he made a public statement that he doesn't care about the identity of an individual, but rather if they are or are not going to stand up for the American working class and poor people. Anyone with a backbone and integrity can do that. Integrity doesn't have uh, skin color, sexuality, gender, ethnicity, or nationality. It's the ability for someone to stand up to the status quo, and when the status quo has forgotten and betrayed most of us. For the last 30 years, Bernie Sanders has stood by the people of this country with his integrity intact. Candidates like Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard stand for the people. They are interested in correcting the flow of power to be more even rather than tilted up. That scares the elites of the oligarchy. These people need the working class to be tired and overworked so we can't start a revolution or a movement. In 2016, Bernie Sanders sparked a movement and it still exists today. And the establishment fears this. So now they've resorted to blatant lies in order to attempt to smear the movement. The left is fractured because it has let the propaganda wing of the American war economy fracture it. And it's no surprise that Elizabeth Warren is sta- has stayed silent about this lie that her staffers are spreading. She has consistently lied about major things to get a few extra points in the polls. She lied about her native heritage. She lied about being fired for her pregnancy. She lied about Medicare for All. And she's lied about being a progressive. Progressives don't attack other progressives in this manner. Elizabeth Warren is showing us that deep down inside, she's still a Republican. And the closer it gets to casting votes in this primary, the more Republican she becomes. Just a side note here, I didn't watch the first Democratic debates of 2020. Like I said, the only candidate on that stage that's worth a damn is Senator Sanders, and the rest of them just want to gang up on him. If I wanted to see a caring, intelligent person get ganged up on by a bunch of rich white people, I'd just relive my elementary school days. I did see the heated moment between Warren and Sanders after the debate. Warren launched into Bernie about calling her a liar on national TV. Now, If she's wound up because of that, then Trump will have a field day with her. It will be the pot calling the kettle black, and that's about as far as those debates will go. And besides, the real progressives have been calling Elizabeth Warren a liar on a national level for a long time. But now that it's on TV, she's got a problem with it? As Aaron Maté points out, Uh, This could all be staged to defame Bernie to try to get more points for Warren, a candidate that has had secret meetings with Queen of the DNC, Hillary Clinton. I do think that progress in this country is going to come down to the labor movement. Even a simple idea like a four-day work week will dynamically restructure the way we live our lives and the way we structure this made-up economy of ours. It introduces the notion of passion in your work. It bolsters the idea of universal basic income. If we really want to be great, then we need to make our middle class stronger and show poor people some compassion. We need to make change in in the systems that create poverty and support candidates that actually stand with the people. Till then, the only people that will validate the nickname greatest country on earth is the liars and cheats that want you to only work for a weekend. That will never come. Uh, I've got some live stand-up comedy dates coming up. If you enjoy any of the content that you have listened to on this podcast, you will probably enjoy my live stand-up comedy. It talks about uh, a lot of the the, uh, similar uh, topics and philosophies that we cover 
in this podcast. Uh, so I'm going to be in uh, Lancaster, PA on January 24th. I'm going to be opening for my good friend Lee Camp in Philadelphia on January 25th and 26th. On January 29th, I'm going to be in Boston, Massachusetts. January 31st, I'm going to be in Portland, Maine. Uh, on February 6th, I'm going to be at the Vermont Law School. Uh, February 7th, I'm going to be in Middlebury, Vermont. February 8th, in Burlington, Vermont. February 9th, in Bridgewater, Vermont. February 10th, uh, back to Burlington, Vermont. Uh, February 11th, in Rochester, New York. February 15th in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Pittsburgh friends, if you missed my December show, there's an opportunity to come check me out. Uh, Check out the uh, Politely Angry uh, before it is recorded um, at the Pittsburgh Fringe Festival in the first week of April. Uh, And then on February 17th, I'm in Huntsville, Alabama. February 20th in Springfield, Missouri. February 21st in Fayetteville, Arkansas, February 22nd in Springdale, Arkansas, and I've got a bunch of dates lined up, a bunch of dates lined up. Um, Go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com for my entire tour schedule. I'm going to be touring all over the country. I'm going to be doing a bunch of dates with my friend Lee Camp as well, Uh, so that's going to be very exciting. And I'm recording my album in March and April. As I just mentioned, on March 20th, I'm going to be recording my album in Washington, D.C. And on March 21st, I'm going to be recording my album in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, as well as the first weekend of April at the Pittsburgh Fringe Festival. So make sure that you guys stay tuned to these announcements. Go to my website. Join my email list. Keep up to date on all of these shows, on all of the things that I'm doing. Um, And if you would like to financially support this show, you can do so by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, uh, All the patrons that have already signed up, all all the people that are already patrons, thank you so much. It means a lot. It really does. Every single, um, every single dollar helps. Every single uh, little tiny amount helps uh, this show get better. Uh, it helps me put out more content and and uh, keep focused on putting out good, interesting, independent, DIY, socially conscious comedy. Uh, so go to patreon.com slash krishmohan, ha ha. And all the patronages start only at $2 a month. And with $2 a month, you get early access to the multi-part forkful of noodles and exclusive stand-up comedy and storytelling tracks that are not available to uh, anybody else except for the patrons plus some of the tiers also get free tickets to live shows so once again go to patreon.com slash krishmohan ha ha 